um, the, 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 the key findings, the first, first, the first one is that um, as a country, there is an enabling legal and policy <coughs> framework. We have uh, quite a number of policies and, 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 and acts that uh, support empowerment and, uh, and uh, adolescent girls' development in Uganda. This includes the constitution, which is the most, constitu uh, most gender-sensitive constitution in Uganda. There are a number of policies, uh, sexual offenses bill, the education policies. They're quite um, focused on trying to address, to address the issues of empowerment. However, our study shows that there is a major gap in terms of implementation and also in terms of realizing uh, the objective they are set, they are set for. <coughs> It was clear in the field that uh, there was little that was known about some of these <coughs> policies, and implementation was very problematic, as I will share with you in, uh, in details in the next slides. We also observed that uh, there were positive changes. I know we know that some of things are slow to change, but there were positive changes that were taking place, and there were a number of opportunities, and mainly in education. Um, uh, education, we, a number of opportunities were shown, especially because of the policy of the universal primary education. But we also ch saw changes in marriage and household roles. So amidst all these challenges, we also have some few um, changes. For instance, in the marriage practices where you know the, my grand-grandmothers had no option but to have husbands identified for them. <coughs> now the young people are able in one way or another to, to choose um, their own partners. Um, and the girls were very excited about that. They could not understand how anyone would ever choose a partner for them. So there's a change there. And, um, and education, similar, you know, most of the girls are able to go to school. The grandmothers, many of them we interviewed, were never had an opportunity to do that. So we recognize there's that change. However, what also came out very, very strongly was the lack of voice. This is a continuity uh, in terms of decision making, and uh, there were very clear uh, demonstrations that uh, you know they didn't—they have very limited voice in the households, in the schools, and in the communities, and that impacted and limited um, their participation and their engagement in other areas. So the voice also, the lack of voice impacted on their knowledge of reproductive health, impacted even on their physical and legal protection. Um, and, and we found that to be very, very central and eventually it affected their agency. Um, you know, we had girls, you know, saying, you know, look, you know, I'm not yet 18, you know, I can't say anything, you know, no one will ever listen to me. Um, no one even understands what I try to say. The, 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 the other, yes, the other, the, the other point that um, I think that is very core and very central to the norms and the practice that we have is that they are entrenched in the systems and they are discriminatory and they continue to impact girls' well-being and agency. And coupled with high levels of poverty, as I'll be discussing, the, uh, the, the situation of poverty in, in Uganda, and this is also you know, more affected by the level of service provision. So there are three in one. There is the discriminatory practices, there are the high levels of poverty, there are the limited service provision and significantly impact on the girls' development. And we also observe and see that, uh, which is basically maybe also known, that the gender discrimination just spans in every part of the girls' lives and women's lives. And, uh, and is reinforced in different um, in different arenas and uh, in different and uh, different patterns. As you move from the household, some of what is happening in the household is reinforced at the school, and then it impacts you know the level of, of marriage, and so uh, and greatly impacting on the development and capacities of these uh, of these young girls. After analysis and. Um, a Listening to the girls' voices, we, we realized that um, in order for one to really address the issues that are impacting the girls, um, that you needed an integrated approach. 
because they are interconnected, they reinforce each other in a way uh, that, uh, that if you only addressed one aspect, uh, it would not, um, it not uh, yield the, re the results that uh, uh, would be required of empowering and en enhancing abilities uh, for the girls to be empowered themselves. So you need an integrated approach. And we know traditionally we have had, you know, program on only oriented to education, some on reproductive health, others in economic capability, in a way uh, limiting the, their, their eff effectiveness because they are not uh, integrated in a way uh, that would address all the needs of the young of the young girls. And in the, the, the subsequent slides, I will show you, I will present how uh, the integrated approach could actually address the, the girls' needs. I would like to go back to the policy context in Uganda. Yeah, the policy context, this is so, it's so important uh, for, for the girls uh, and, and for empowering uh, uh, women. Uh, as I said before, there are so many of these uh, policies, and uh, there is a major gap, especially in the in the implementation. Um, for instance, the, the education it was very clear uh, that the, the, there is gender parity right now. It's one of those it's one of, one of the MDGs that Uganda will achieve, and it was evident in the uh, evident in the field, but the quality of education uh, was, was wanting. And consequently, many of the girls are dropping out uh, at primary level, primary five. And the ways of enforcing, you know, the school attendance and the retention is also, is also not, uh, n not, not effective. Um, and we had the stories like in the field, you know, parents saying, <coughs> you know, we are sending our girls just to grow up. You know, they are going to the schools and they're, 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 they're growing up. So these policies, <coughs> good as they are, they are not. But I just want to draw your attention to one of the policies, some of the few policies, um, that is the, the marriage and divorce bill. And this is a comprehensive <coughs> uh, policy that definitely would address many of the social no norms and, and the practices. And this is a policy that has been in, uh, in, uh, in, in Parliament for the last 40 years. That clearly shows you how sticky are some of the norms and the practices. People still believe uh, in, in the traditional marriages, in, um, in um, they, they, they don't like, the, they want the continuity of the bride wealth. That was a major issue that was discussed in parliament that we are trying to dilute it by arguing that it should be, uh, it should be just bride, bride gifts they couldn't have us, they didn't want us to put in the bride gift. So as I speak, it has been, it has been again withdrawn from <coughs> parliament to start another form of, uh, of, uh, of discussion uh, <coughs> about that uh, marriage bill. So that the policy environment and the, the, the limited enforcement, but also the non-passing of the bills that would definitely be very critical for changing some of these practices is not passed. Th this one, I'd like, I, I guess this is uh, the, the high levels of, uh, of poverty uh, in Uganda. Um, and uh, uh, because I say this, I show you this because in the findings we show that there is a very, very close connection with the poverty levels in these communities. So which leads parents to prioritize uh, girls versus boys, you know, at even attendance. You know, like I sp as I speak now, this is a time for weeding and so on. So the parents would require, you know, some form of, of help. And then who would leave? Um, then that would be possibly and potentially a girl. Those arrows show the study communities. Um, uh, that was in Mayugi and Zimbabwe. And we purposefully selected these uh, districts because they are classified as hard to reach. Hard to reach and they are also uh, a poor, poor in, they are, they, are, they are poor, they, they belong to the regions that, that, that are poor. So that sets the context of the girls we talked to and the parents, we even talked to the grandmothers, we talked to the fathers, we talked to the leaders in those communities. I would like to move quickly uh, on the positive changes, to reinforce the positive changes, because I think these positive changes are the ones we are going to build on 
in order to improve and uh, the lives of, of, of girls and um, and uh, in in our communities. I just I just love this quote of this grandmother. You know, we never saw those papers you are writing on, and that's it. Period. She never saw them. She had no opportunity. And then, but now the girls are able to see them, and she could see that I was using them, and she could see that uh, the girls now um, uh, are, are going uh, are going are going to school. So that is that is, that is uh, that's okay. But I want to draw attention that the completion rate is uh, is miserably low for girls at three percent. I know it's not so good for boys, but that's uh, that's a very significant five percent, and that this is 2013. MDG report uh, for you for Uganda, uh, and so so we have a concern there, and we have major questions on the attainment uh, on, on education achievements. Um, I I was I mentioned also that there are other changes in marriage, also in household. There is increasing change in the household division of labor, but not 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 so, uh, so significant. The girls move, but there's still also quite a lot of limitations in which spaces. Uh, um, uh, uh, in which spaces would uh, they would move in? Uh, I, I like this quotation also of one of the grandmothers that in our time, we were, in terms of marriage, we were like sold, but now the girls are able to choose their partners. But that eventually we'll see uh, some of the challenges that uh, that that we see emerging because of some of the what parents think too much rights. The girls are able to choose their partners. And definitely, they believe that the girls are not choosing the right partners. And that is creating a lot of, of challenges uh, <coughs> and, and problems. But it is a change. You know, they are, they are, they, someone is not choosing for them. I'd like to move quickly to, um, to the issue of the slow and the patchy change. You know, we see change, but you know, we can't really even pin it down. As soon as we pin it down, as, as soon as we reflect on it, there's some other things that are coming in. And, and, and it all rotates to these kinds of lack of voice, uh, which really has a multiplier effect or, um, and limits them, for instance, for, for, for instance, in the income generation potential, potentials. Because you know, you, you can't really negotiate your way around limit their access to reproduct, reprodu reproductive and uh, sexual health. And as I've said, uh, right now, in the biggest discussion in Uganda is, um, is, a, is a early pregnancy. Actually, they don't even say early marriage. They say early pregnancy is, a, is a one of the major, major discussions because increasingly the many young girls from 14 years are getting pregnant. And the, ba the big change is that they're not married. And that is a major, ma major thing, and um, you know which uh, which have come up. And uh, you know, I, I, I also love the quote that a parent remains a parent. So, period. You cannot just even challenge, and that has a lot of implications uh, uh, for the girls. Um, and 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 this coupled with this with the limited investment. Uh, in in in, girl, in girls education, because we see increasingly the the girls are stopping at primary primary <coughs> level because there is more investment uh, after that level, and many parents are not choosing uh, choosing to that choosing that limited vocational and technical schools. That is also another way that is really um, impacting on the uh, on the girls agency. Yeah, I move on uh, as a, an anthropologist. I like the quotes that really this these are more to show also partly the illustration and the limited change. My land, the, the land is for my brothers and the girls know. Uh, it's only given to boys since they, the girls can never own land where they are born. This is a girl, she's already you know deprived at that age. Uh, decisions at home are made by my father because he's the head of the family. Uh, the mother can only make decisions when the father, uh, the father is away, and uh, and each time I think of the the inheritance, I know I remember my father died when we were 16 years, when I was 16 years old, and he was a very rich man, but I I don't think I got even a cup, as part of the inheritance, 
Um, so, uh, which really the, the girls' voices and stories echoed uh, back to me because though he was a rich man with a lot of land and property, I don't think I even got a cup out of the, uh, the land. That was a, a non-negotiable issue, so I never had land. Um, so more, I'd like also to draw your attention more to these discriminatory norms that are really persisting and, and the intersection with, uh, with, uh, with poverty. Yes, uh, and, and that, that is uh, very central because the MDG shows, uh, the, the recent report for Uganda shows that uh, absolute poverty has been halved in Uganda. But we know now currently that uh, the poverty strategies that have been ad adopted have not addressed the discriminatory norms. They have not addressed the violence in schools. They have not uh, reduced the violence in, in homes. Um, and so there is a challenge. Why we have re we reduced the, the poverty levels, uh, we have not. Uh, we have not. I just wanted to quickly show you that table, which shows some persistence and continuity in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of uh, 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 fast marriage age, and you can see I I you know across the board there are very there are slight changes which means that the, even those regions with uh, better economic indicators uh, due to the sticky norms and practices, early marriage is continuing. So somehow the economic strategies have not really addressed the, addressed the, the problem. Yeah, that is also, uh, you know, if, if I really don't finish, I would like, you to, I would like to show you that one. Um, uh, especially the issue of the silence and taboos around women's bodies is so significant and their, their beliefs and, uh, and the norms. For instance, a girl cannot uh, you know, drop blood in, in her father's home, so definitely as soon as she starts menstruating, she would rather move out and uh, possibly get married. So this abrupt, abrupt transition from childhood to, to womanhood for these girls has been a major, a major, major problem for, for the girls. This technology, yes. Again, um, a girl remains a target of culture and somehow everybody is very cautious of it. You know, and the culture is reinforced through the girl. And I saw this in the discussions for the dom domestic, the, the marriage and divorce bill. Everybody called on culture, you know, according to our culture, our women must do this. Our girls, you know, can't, can't behave like this. We must have bright words. They must be married properly, you know, those kinds of arguments. So we are, girls still remain a target, a target of, the, of, of, of culture and definitely limiting their agency and, and, uh, and the development. <laughs> yeah, and early marriage. Um, we know the, the, the intersection. One, one key thing we found that many programs actually do not want to target the, whole, the household. They target the schools, they target the communities, they target national level, but the household, we have found it to be very foundational. What happens at the household, you know, replicates itself, reinforces itself, and eventually affects the, uh, the, the, the outcome um, for, for, for the girl and the, the lack uh, of, of agency. If the chair could uh, allow me just uh, a few, one, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> I'm about to finish. Um, I've read, actually I did mention one thing I wanted to mention, the integrated nature that is needed. And, uh, and, and if I had time, I know Plan International in Uganda and BRAC are, are, are trying out programs that support the women, girls leadership but also support the income generation they also support the the education in a way that is so is holistic uh, that that offers actually an opportunity and a chance to ensure that the the, the full development uh, and and, uh, and especially developing the agency and also be able to address other needs reproductive and and the economic needs uh, are addressed so we think there is hope there if that, that integrated approach could be um, adopted or could be actually tried out by a number of, a number of agencies. So strategies, 
I can't live without saying the strategies. What do we think that uh, needs to be done? One, definitely from the research, we see that there will need to be a number of policies because governments and, and everybody works through the different policies. And, and the policies across the board, you know, from education, from the, you know, sexual offenses, from marriage, inheritance. But coupled with that, with that, because we found a lot of lack of knowledge, uh, especially uh, around reproductive health. I remember sitting with a young girl of about to 15, I said, Madam, how did I get pregnant? She has a baby. Can you explain to me how I got pregnant? And, and that tells you that information is not going through, although we are working very, very hard. I know when we discussed with, um, uh, with UNFPA, they were shocked that there could be that level of lack of knowledge. Um, and we, we are moving in closely also to look at secondary education. Secondary education, there's a, my, a lot of emphasis on primary education, but I think we need to ask ourselves, would it be, would it be helpful in, in, in reducing these entrenched norms? You know, and, and, and we need to engage. And that's where we come in also with the, the, the post-2015 uh, post discussions. W how ca how, what can we do to enable the empowerment, to enable the full development, to enable the agency of the girls? Because our, our belief and our uh, theoretical and change, the, change, the, the change framework is that we believe once you empower girls, adolescent girls at <coughs> this stage, then they are multiply effects later on in their life and also for community and, 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 the, and the countries. So, and Uganda, we know how, Uganda in the recent report, we have received gender, we have achieved uh, in terms of gender parity. That's a big flag in Uganda in terms of MDGs. But at the same time, the discussion, daily discussions shows the persistence and the, the persistence of gender inequalities, the, 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 the social norms reinforcing each other and effectively curtailing um, the development of, of these girls. So Chairperson, this is the last <laughs> slide. <laughs> <laughs> I promise this is the last one. <laughs> So what can we do for Uganda? I just propose for Uganda, U U Uganda at least, and many countries that, uh, that are in similar situation. Right, uh, right now, I think even today in Uganda, they are launching uh, the, the UNFPA, the population report, the World Population Report 2013. And guess what? The theme is on early pregnancy. You know, they are calling them early, ma is, it, is it early mothers? or something like that, but really it's a concern, it's a global concern. So given Uganda's political and economic and social context, and more so the focus right now when we discuss MDGs in Uganda, we have a vision of 2040. And with that uh, vision of 2040, the, the focus is on social transformation. And I was shocked that there, is, there isn't much gender in that document. Social transformation as the most effective way of attaining the aspirations of Ugandans. And that is going to be done through, you know, focusing on major things, infrastructure development, big things, and very limited spending, very limited focus on social sectors. They are mentioned as major, as major areas of, uh, of interest, but the discussion is more on access. So I think we need to really to, to move closer and engage uh, the government. So that's why for me, uh, the, the focus and actually having a specific gender, gender goal in the next MD, MDGs would definitely be of relevancy uh, to Uganda because then it will possibly you know, reinforce some of the national provisions and it will also lead to allocation of resources. It will, and more so on monitoring you know, the, the, the global enforcement and monitoring the performance. But I think without this gender goal, <coughs> I'm worried I see that the general focus now seems to be much broader and may never capture the issues, the experiences, the lived experiences um, uh, that we are, we, are, we, are, we are talking now, we're talking about now. I was also lucky to attend the, Africa, the uh, Af African Union kind of the MDG 2015 meeting. <coughs> you see broader perspectives, you know, social transformation, and I think we need to zero in on issues of gender because I do still believe that they are very fundamental in addressing the, the inequalities um, 
in our countries. Thank you very much.